Yeah. All right, welcome everybody. Speak English, Don. Welcome everybody. I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight. Uh, we got a lot of topics to cover. Um, first of all, I'd like to recognize uh, our councils at large that are here. Moises Rodriguez and Shayna Bonds are here tonight. Yay! Big hand, come on. <laughs> Okay, that's the last ones we're going to get. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, well, f first off, um, we have, uh, we're going to go over with the, if you've got an agenda there, we're starting off with uh, Ward 2 uh, School Committee Man Andy Robinson is going to give us a little update on the Whitman School. So, Andy, come on up. Sure. Hey, everyone. Um, so, uh, as far as the Whitman School goes, um, we, uh, have been working on uh, getting a feasibility report. Um, we, we, ha we hired an outside contractor to come in, take a look at the building kind of from top to bottom, inside and out, um, and, and kind of give us an idea of what the cost will be to bring that school back online. Um, some of the things we know um, is that it needs an elevator, which is a pretty significant expense. Um, you know, there's going to be some issues uh, because it's an old building with lead and mold and asbestos, likely. Um, we know that if we bring the school back online, we're going to be able to get about 10 classrooms out of it. Um, we're probably looking, uh, if and if we if we use that building, um, to use it in, the, in a similar way we did the Barrett Russell, um, the old B.B. Russell School, which is now a kindergarten center. Um, we're a really long way from uh, really any kind of decisions on whether or not we're going to bring the Whitman back online. Um, sure. Can I, I feel like I'm getting a little feedback. Um, we're, we're kind of a really long way from, from making any final decisions on whether or not to bring that school back online. It's a city-owned building now. The mayor has kind of let us know that it's available to us if it becomes feasible for us to bring it back online. Um, you know, a lot of the things that uh, we'll kind of come down to in terms of final decisions on the Whitman is uh, how much of the work we can kind of bring in-house. Um, some of the work that needs to be done on old buildings like that, we have to kind of contract out for it, and that's costs increase significantly. We can't build an elevator, um, you know, for example. Um, so uh, kind of a long way to go yet. Um, you know, probably the earliest we would even consider bringing that building back online or even be able to bring it back online is uh, September of 2015, which is a whole other school year. Um, you know, there's going to have to be a lot of conversations between city side and school side and, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of those types of things. I'm happy to try to answer any questions or concerns people might have about the Whitman or anything else. I know we got kind of a heavy agenda tonight. I don't want to capitalize a lot of time. Um, but there's a lot of great things going on in the school district. Um, you know, we're, we're about to enter into MCAS. Um, we have about 1,100 students in the city who are field testing PARC, um, which is the kind of new... Uh, national evaluation tool um, that the that the feds and the state are hoping to bring online in the next year or two. Um, they're field testing some of the initial um, assessment tools now, and we'll have about 1,100 students here in Brockton at a handful of schools taking that test to kind of inform, uh, you know, how good the assessment is and, and whether or not it's something we w that, that, that the feds want to continue to use um, or, or change um, before full implementation. Um, but, you know, a lot of great things. Uh, the Barrett-Russell, um, I think, has probably, you know, really been a, a, one of the most positive things about uh, Ward 2 in, this, in the school district side. Um, if you haven't been over there, it's an amazing little space, um, given that it was basically an abandoned building with a, with a city park attached to it that, that really didn't have a lot to offer the neighborhood. Uh, you know, it's, it's a clean space, a new parking lot, just an amazing little building that, that uh, you know, caters to kindergartners. <laughs> um, you walk into that building and everything is tiny, but everything is bright and colorful, and there are, you know, a couple hundred kids going to kindergarten there every day and just receiving an amazing education. Um, and so if you haven't had time to drive over into that little corner um, of Ward 2, I would encourage you to drive by. If anybody would ever like to see it, um, we, can, we can arrange for that as well. Um, I brought business cards. Um, happy to leave them with any of you. There's a lot of familiar faces in this room to me. Um, um, but, but certainly if anybody wants to talk further, or if anybody has any questions that I can answer now, I'd be happy to do my best to do that. Crickets. Yeah, it was <laughs> easy, an easy night for me. I'm going to hang around for the rest of the meeting. I'll hang around after the meeting. Um, is there anybody who would like a business card? I can just make sure and drop it with you. Okay, 
great. I'll, I'll find you guys and make sure you have my contact information. But I'll be hanging around the rest of the night. Uh, find me in the back of the room or find me after the meeting's over. I'm happy to talk to you about anything that uh, you might be concerned about or just want more information about, okay? Appreciate the time. Thank you. <laughs> I guess they put, shouldn't have put it on the agenda. You were a Green Bay Packer fan. Nobody really wants to talk to you now. <laughs> okay. Now, here's a nice big project in Ward 2. We're going to talk about the Eggers Playground area. And we have Tim Carpenter, the Parks and Recreation Commissioner, and Pam Gurley from the Planning Department. She made, made sure I said that because she's proud of it. <coughs> right, Pam? <laughs> gonna, so come on up. We're going to give you a little uh, update on what's going on with, uh, with uh, James Eggers Park. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be um, Good evening. Uh, Tim Carpenter, Superintendent of Parks for the City of Brockton. Um, this is the renovation of James Edgar Park, um, done under the park grant. And um, at this point, I would say we are close to halfway through the project. Um, we started um, about the middle of November, early middle November. Um, and as you all remember, just after Thanksgiving, we got the heavy, deep freeze. Um, and that has slowed things down um, considerably over there. Um, but in the preceding three weeks, um, the company contracted to do the work, uh, Green Acres, has done a considerable amount. Um, so I would say that all of the demo work has been done, um, and much of the site has been prepped for... Um, resumption of construction hopefully in the next week or so um, depending April. on you know depending on what the weather does to us um, so at this point um, the old horseshoe pits have been removed um, that area will um, become the volleyball courts and right next to that will be the futsal court um, that area has been prepped as well um, and on the corner of Winthrop and Harvard will be the basketball court. Um, and uh, so that area has been prepped as well. There's a new path actually um, that will lead right to the corner there um, as well as a mid-gate access. The whole park um, will really be connected by a series of paths. Um, really make the park much more accessible to everyone. Um, you know, unfortunately, it won't be a complete loop around the park, um, which would have been great for kids on bikes. But uh, there will be enough paths, they will be wide enough that um, I think people will be able to, uh, to traverse the different areas of the park um, with a greater access. Um, we've also working on um, an increased parking lot over there um, so that when there are events, um, We'll have much more parking capacity. It'll uh, ease the um, problem of people parking on the street over there. Parking in the basketball court. The old basketball court will be the new parking lot. A um, couple of the other changes. Um, we will, we're installing the rubber port in place, rubber base underneath the play equipment over there. Um, we're also installing a new swing set because we've removed all of the old wooden equipment. Um, that was on the opposite side of the park. So there will be a new swing set over there, again, with the rubber base under it. Um, splash pad. Yep, we'll be uh, installing a splash pad um, just inside of the existing gate. Um, so we've uh, got all our permits together for that. Hopefully um, all that construction, again, starts around the 1st of April. Um, I'm pretty excited about the project. I think it's progressing nicely. Um, we'll also have the skate park in the corner of Marciano and Dover. Um, so that, that skate park will be installed over there. That'll be, that'll consist of um, pre-made concrete um, obstacles or ramps and whatever you want to call them. Um, so they'll be in that corner sort of using the topography, the existing topography, to um, tie it in pretty nicely. And then um, in terms of the ball field, we're going to install some drainage down the right field line 
uh, which has always sort of seemed to have been a problem, as well as some irrigation on the infield. We'll also be removing about five feet from the back of the infield, the interface of the infield and the outfield, where over time there's, there's developed a lip. Um, kind of creates a, a difficult situation when guys, uh, you know, on a, on a ground ball, it's going to take that odd hop. So we'll cut that area out, remove that lip, resod that area, um, and hopefully have that field um, return to its its glory here shortly. Backstop. 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 Oh yeah, brand um, new backstop. it'll be a brand new backstop as well. Um, it'll uh, it'll be just as tall. And the overhang will be a little bit longer um, to hopefully catch some of the, uh, the foul balls that the screen um, in years past hasn't, hasn't caught. There will be new player benches over there as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I, I think the improvements to the park are, are going to be tremendous. Um, our completion date. Um, beginning of June. Should be the beginning of June. Um, you know, maybe some punch list stuff, you know, to the end of June, but that's sort of our drop dead date. Um, I'd like to thank Pam for all the work that she's done with this as well. Um, she really has put in a lot of time and effort, um, and you won't see her traping through the mud out there, but I will be. <laughs> so Not unless I get out of the boots. Um, unless you have. Good thing we're on TV. I say something else. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that's oh, pretty so, much okay. it. But just to, we had a lot of concerns about the dog mess. Yeah. What's going to be going on with uh, the dogs in the area getting on the ball field, walking them in there, around the park. There's a big mess now. It looks like, uh, I don't even want to say what it looks like, on those sidewalks going around the park. So Well, people... People, number pe one. Pe pe people should be cleaning up they should be. after their dogs. And secondly, after building this nice park, it's not for the dogs. <laughs> but we're going to have... We will have signage throughout the park that um, we don't want any dogs on the ball field whatsoever. Um, pretty obvious reasons there. Um, somebody goes sliding into second. You want it to just be dirt. They come <laughs> up. <there. laughs> um, so there won't be any ball, you know, when obviously we'll have signage to that effect. Um, so no dogs allowed on the ball field. Um, and we will also be providing um, what we refer to as mutt mitts. Um, if you've been up in DW Fields Park, you've obviously seen them. Um, it's just a, a standard little container. People are more than welcome to grab their little plastic bag. And um, hopefully it helps us uh, control the, the problem a little bit more. And what about the sidewalks now? I know you said mentioning about maybe you and the DPW working to get that cleaned up. <coughs> yep, we've, uh, we've sent a crew over there twice so far, um, and we're hoping to um, time our next visit over there with when they sweep the streets. Um, a little help from the neighbors would be... Yeah, I've, I've got would, some info on would, some neighbors. Would be appreciated because obviously it's people in the neighborhood that are... Yeah, we'll be DNA. DNA testing them. <laughs> 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 we got a question yep, down <laughs> Yeah. How many parking spots are you going to have? Oh, uh, it's going to be um, 42. 40 anyway. Yeah, Bought, no, 50. 40 or the, yeah, if you include 50. where the current parking area is, it'll be upwards of 50. Yeah, I can feel that. I, I used same thing when my son played Legion here. So, so yes, we've definitely but increased the parking quite a bit. Um, you know, we're hoping that, um, you know, even you know JV baseball, you know, we can get some people to go watch that. And we've also increased the width on the gate to make it easier for buses to get in and out of there as well. Allowed during within two hours of a ball game or something like that. 
the hope with um, putting the parking lot where the old basketball courts was is to alleviate any parking on street around the ball field whatsoever. Well, it's more than uh, there because remember they were playing basketball in the same spot that they were parking in. So we I probably didn't have. Forty and more isn't any good if it isn't enough. It still isn't enough. I, I, unfortunately, it's the best we could do with the space that yeah, we had. That's why I'm suggesting you have some kind of signage for parking you're involved in. <coughs> that's not actually. Unfortunately, that would be the traffic commission and. Yeah, the residents probably are not going to want it. I mean, they're just probably not. Hello, just a quick question about the, the playground that was put in. I'm in Rotary, and we put in a, a mm -hmm. handicap yep. play area before. What's going on with that? Is it in good condition? Is it being worked on? Um, Does the club need to do anything? Should it have anything? At this point, we have purchased um, a lot of replacement parts for that equipment, um, which once the um, project is nearing completion, the Parks Department will install. So I think that um, the particular piece of equipment that you're talking about is in relatively good shape. Like I say, we do have some replacement parts for it. Um, and obviously the new um, safety base will be brought to the level of the ramp so that it is accessible continuously. I was just wondering about the lighting. Uh, we do not have plans to do lighting at this point. Okay. Anything else? So with the dog, um, I, I'm not sure if I heard you say this or not, but with the dog issue, um, is, could there be or is there going to be just a designated area for folks to walk their dogs or to maybe fence off a little place for a little dog park or something? Is that possible? We've pretty much utilize just about every square inch that we have available over there. Um, you know, and I have a dog, you know, um, but it really is the responsibility of the dog walker to pick up after their dogs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Not that they can't walk them. It's right. It's, you know, yeah. it's obviously the leash law, all that. Um, the only real change over there is going to be really enforcing not having dogs on the ball field. Um, because that is a big issue. And is there, um, is there like a percentage, I guess, differential from the green space that's there now and what's going to be taken up for some of this asphalt and the, the wider lanes and the, the this or that? Like, how much is left as to what was there before for green? It's actually, Shane, uh -huh. um, this will probably help you so I can give you this. Okay, I'll take a look at it. Thanks. So it, you'll get more of a visual on what it's going to look like. Okay. Okay. Thanks. On the matter of the dogs playing in the ball field, because we see a lot of people exercising and doing things with their dogs there, would the animal control at different times just kind of cruise by and surprise them and say, sorry, you can't be there? Until there's actual signage up, I don't think animal control can actually But once do it's up in the park, it's done and complete and ready to go? That is the hope. Because I live in the neighborhood, and we can see from the house the loose dogs that are there hanging out. And like when my son's down there, I'm nervous because if those dogs are loose, like right. I don't want to see it. My I mean, kids are big kids, but still it's... Obviously all dogs are, by city ordinance, supposed to be on a leash. Um, and there was that little hole in sort of the center <laughs> field area that I think a lot of the dogs got through. But... Um, I don't know whether I included, I think I included that picture. Um, no, I didn't. Um, but the whole, basically from right center where the 402 foot sign is, mm -hmm. all the way to left, the left field line, that'll all be new 10 foot fence. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the playground material, um, is that going to be like the one at O'Donnell? Yes, ma'am. Is that what it looks yep. like? The that port in place, rubber, okay. you know. So, you know, we've, we've analyzed the play equipment, the required fall width, unfortunate term, but that's what they call it. <laughs> um, so we've done all that analyzation, and, you know, we will have that, that same port in place. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? <laughs>
And there is actually an ordinance that says you must pick up your dog's mess. And it could be a fine from $35 to $250 if you don't. So at that time, when it is finished, I'm hoping that if we have some code enforcement down there. Chris, you'd really love to pick a few of those guys up, wouldn't you? Chris Perez. That's your area, buddy. <laughs> be on the watch. Be on the watch. But anyway, so that's it. All right. Um, next, we're going to have Jason Barboza from, from Vincente's Market. This is a big project. It's going to really brighten up Warren Ave and uh, Pleasant Street. And it's going to finally come to fruition. And Thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I'm Jason. I'm general manager of Vicente Supermarket. I would like to thank Tom, um, the, the city, the mayor, Moses, for uh, helping us. Uh, we've been getting wide, um, great city support from everyone. Per, uh, permanent process has been nice and easy. Everybody's been flexible and really working with us uh, to get this project done. So I really want to thank all you guys and uh, for helping our family um, to transition down to Pleasant Street to open up this new supermarket. Um, the new supermarket is going to be 32,000 square feet. Um, you know, produce, uh, produce department, meat department, um, same departments that we have now in our current supermarket with an addition of a seafood market, which we currently don't have. And, in the, and we're going to extend on every other department, um, just as our kitchen department. Um, we're also going to partner up with the health center where they're going to come on site and we're going to do a lot of partnership together to really um, reach out to the community. And uh, we're, this site's really going to be a focus on healthy eating and healthy living. And so we're going to have a test kitchen on site. We're going to bring in a prof uh, professional chef every week to kind of come in and teach our customers how to cook healthy with the products that they use from back home. And this is the type of collaboration we're going to be doing with the health center. And um, our focus and our vision and mission is really to use this supermarket as the hub of Brockton, really a place to really bring in the community and have events there. If, if, um, if we need to get a message across, I want it to come here and kind of get it across our customers. Um, our family is also partnering up with um, Uplift Solutions, which is a nonprofit um, out of um, Philadelphia, which is owned by Jeff Brown, which owns 11 shop rights in the Philadelphia um, neighborhood. His strategy and his mission and his vision is, is to open supermarkets in uh, underserved um, communities, and sometimes you might call that a food desert, and show them that you can still have beautiful supermarkets, healthy food, in underserved areas. And they're coming on board and helping us, um, you know, carry their same vision, but over here in Brockton. And I went down to uh, Philadelphia, and I've seen this story, and it's in South Philly, and it's not the prettiest neighborhood, um, you know, in, in the nation. And they did it, and they got it done. And I've I seen their vision, I've seen their strategy, and just um, us being able to partner up with them and them coming on board, it's going to be a, a eight to ten month um, partnership, and just getting us ready, um, teaching us how they do how they do things and how they use the community and how they're a really a hub of their community, and that's what we want to bring over here in the supermarket. So we're excited. Um, we've been working very hard, and we continue to to work hard on getting this project done. It, but not only just completed, but done right. And um, so, yeah, pretty much it. So any questions or comments, and I'll, I'll answer any question um, anyone has about the, uh, about the project. Um, I um, haven't thought about that yet, but it would be the same that we have now. Um, but if things go well, um, I'm, I'm the type of person to kind of want to extend hours if, if we can, if it makes sense. But we are planning on having a night crew, so that has to kind of, uh, the logistics with, with that has to be managed correctly. So you're, you're going to be like revamping that entire parking lot and putting lighting in it? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's, yeah, it's a huge development project. Um, we brought in the right team, the right people, the right contractors, um, you know, same contractors that build Roach Brothers, Trukies, and all those supermarkets. So everything's being done right. We're, we're doing the whole parking lot over. We're doing the whole interior of the store. 
and it's going to be done just like any other supermarket would be done. So it's possible other, other stores make it, we can have like a, maybe a subway else going to maybe a... Oh, there's two retail pads which we haven't um, shopped yet. We've just been focused on the supermarket, and we want to really get the supermarket going first, and then as, after that we can then focus on getting the um, getting two retailers to come on site with two retail pads. So you have a supermarket, a health center, and two retail pads uh, coming on board. Uh, hopefully soon. Um, we're, we're thinking it's going to take between uh, seven to eight months. Um, it's just interior, really, that's going to take a lot of work because the structure is already there. But we're hoping to uh, hopefully start construction in middle of May. Yes. From Connecticut, Rhode Island, some of these other places yes. that come now. Yeah. What do you anticipate, um, maybe like a percentage or something, of an increase in, in viewership of, of new stores? As far as breaking down the, the like, each yeah. city? How, how much more, you know, how much more Customers? volume will you be okay, um, doing fairs and things like this? You know, we, we budget it. Uh, I, I would think... Um, about maybe a little bit less than double what we're doing now. Maybe what we're doing now plus another half or plus another 75%. But um, it's really hard to gauge those numbers. We, we've done studies to try to see where our volume might be, but it's kind of, and then the health center coming on board kind of changes the game a little bit. So um, where it's, it's really a toss up, but I would say at least what we're doing now plus another half or plus another 75% of that. I have. The back. And I think um, in the food industry now, there's a couple of trends. One is a movement towards either a locally sourced produce and organic. And then the second is the whole issue about cigarettes and alcohol. And I wondered if you had any thoughts yeah. in terms of your store. Yeah, so um, going down to Shoplift, one thing they were great at doing was um, providing local and organic produce. So what they do with their local produce, they source them during the spring and summertime, which we're going to do the same. And during the winter time, where you know the season's not really there for local produce, you kind of have to wind it down a little bit. So we plan on um, doing something similar over here and partner up with local farms and having um, local produce and organic, also sourcing organic um, produce from our wholesalers and from the Chelsea market. And we, in our layout, we do have a, a plan on having an organic section in there for produce. Um, the other question was um, cigarettes and alcohol. I've seen what CVS did. Um, CVS banned um, cigarettes from the store. You know, I've been, I kind of thought about that before they did, and I kind of, there, there was another retailer out in um, Los Angeles. Uh, he was a Hispanic um, retailer, and he had about 20 stores, and he was so focused on selling food and not, you know, trying to nickel and dime the community with um, selling alcohol and cigarettes. He did have banned wine. And he sold, you know, family wine and family beer. And we kind of took the, the same concept. And we used to have liquor ourselves. And we kind of, we got rid of the liquor and just kept, kept beer and wine. And we got rid of the single beers because we didn't want to be a shop where, you know, everyone come in. We want to just focus on, we're here to sell groceries. And we don't want to, you know, start trying to sell nips of liquor and, you know, sell 40-ounce bottles of, of beer. So we kind of transitioned away from that. I think the next step is cigarettes for us, and uh, I don't know when we'll stop selling cigarettes, but with my vision uh, and my mission, I do see us stop. Um, I can't see us stopping, stopping selling cigarettes for a long time. And also to add to that, to, to, uh, to add to that, we don't sell like um, the single blunts and things like that also. So it's, we're progressively getting there more and more and more. So uh, thank you. Yeah, everything. Um, it's hard to gauge how many. Um, Uplift is really going to help us um, put a higher process together on how they go about hiring um, new employees. Uh, all of our employees are, all of our management is going to come from the same supermarket. Might be exceptions to some, so we're going to have a bakery. We plan on, we don't have a bakery now, 
So we might have to go outside the box and finding a great um, bakery manager to kind of come on board and help us transition to that. But for the most part and for the current departments we have now, um, all of our hiring uh, will come from Brockton. If all the applications come from Brockton, then they'll be from Brockton. What exception to certain management? It will be a dessert? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. You mentioned having um, a night crew. Yeah. Is that like the delivery? Is that when you're going to have your deliveries and big trucks and things coming in? Yes. We, we plan on doing that. And that will help out the city also, logistically, not having trucks coming in. Well, they still might come in, to, um, you know, maybe around the 8, 9 o'clock, so our crew can kind of get ready. But it, it, it will help a little bit, not coming in during, um, you know, the traffic time. So, yes. Are you going to have the setup where the shop carriages don't leave the back lot? Yeah, we're going to have, um, it's called uh, Cartronics. Okay. So we're going to put the wheel lock. Yeah. And we're no, I know, I know. Um, we're actually working on that technology right now in our current supermarket. Yes. I don't, um, but if I just, you know, use the same numbers I gave her, maybe what we have now plus a, another half or another 75 percent. It's, uh, but working with Shoplift, I think they're going to help us do that. And just speaking to them, one of the practices you you kind of have to overhire when you first come in because a lot of employees tend to, you know, move away. And I've seen um, other supermarkets when they when they open, they they tend to do that a little bit. But to give you a number right now, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, thank you. Thank you. All righty. Well, I'm kind of upset he's not going to sell those quarts of beer. I have to go someplace else, I guess. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know she'll. She. F oh, what do you get yours, uh, Pam? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now we're going to have uh, Bob Jenkins come up. He's the interim new, uh, director of the BRA. Give us a little update on a few things. And when you're done with the pizza, there are um, cookies and there's some uh, nice little mini cupcakes from uh, Melissa Rodriguez she made uh, from her business. What's it called? <laughs> Malicious. That's right. Get them before Chris Perez grabs them all. I saw them down there eyeing them. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, folks, uh, for inviting me. Tom, thank you for dinner once again. Um, just to go through this sheet quickly, the Brockton Redevelopment Authority does a lot of uh, activity in Ward 2, just so that you know. Um, one of our most active programs in the last couple of years has been our homeowner rehabilitation. Um, we have done, as you can see on the list, we've done three properties that are in Ward 2. Um, I don't have to talk about James Eggers' playground because Tim and Pam did an excellent job, but we are doing one at um, Parmeter Park. Uh, also, that's in Ward 2 with a special EDA grant, um, EDI grant, and then also through the receivership program. Uh, a couple of years back, or even last year, we came and we talked about the receivership program. It is still very active in Ward 2. A uh, couple of properties that are listed here, one that's not on here that probably should be is 21 Ellsworth Street. Uh, that's a property that actually started under receivership, <coughs> had a couple of fires. <laughs> Um, it didn't burn to the ground, but we kind of demoed it after the third fire. Um, it was tough winter, tough, winter, tough property, um, so we finally got it demoed, so that's a good thing. Um, the current one that's being worked on is 72 Newberry Street, which is a two-family that is owned by Sovereign Bank. It is under receivership. Uh, it will be rehabbed, and the end goal is to sell it to a first-time home buyer. Um, 262 Green Street was a Neighborhood Stabilization 3 project, which is currently owned by the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. 
We're now currently working with the mayor's office and Old Colony Y to actually um, occupy that building, that three-family property. Um, 101 Newberry Street, that was one of the first neighborhood stabilization program uh, projects we did, NSP1, with Mass Housing Investment Corporation. City played a big role in identifying property that was on Highland, Newberry, and Green Street. Um, some public facilities, CDBG funding that was done in Ward 2 was a war memorial, which was a big one. Uh, and we've also completed uh, renovations of the gymnasium at the Boys and Girls Club. If you look on your map, a lot of these you'll see their location. We kind of moving into some very good technology, GIS, so we can actually map certain wards, certain neighborhoods, the activity that we're doing in those neighborhoods. So, Any questions? Excellent. One of the things I just want to oh, try to get away. <laughs> you see me every day. Why do you have a question? One of the people want to know, is one of the neighborhood cleanups going to be here? Um, we are talking about a neighborhood cleanup. Thank you. We are looking at a neighborhood cleanup. Uh, usually we do Ward 2 or Ward 3. Um, we still have yet to decide. Uh, the Housing Authority, the BRA, and the Mayor's Office will probably decide in the next 30 days, which we're probably going to try to do two, uh, only because we usually get Home Depot as a corporate sponsor. This year we're also going to try to get Lowe's. So we're going to try to do two, and more than likely we'll end up in the two uh, neighborhoods we usually target only because we have a, uh, open spaces in Ward 2 or Ward 3 or both. All right. Excellent. Yes, sir. of whether you have internal staff that does some, whether you subcontract to certain we all and not to others. How does that all work? Sure. Does That's it a change from building to building? It, it does. We bid everything out. Um, through our homeowner rehab, and we do mostly homeowner rehabilitation. That's our biggest activity. We, you won't have to be income eligible. Um, most of Brockton is. <coughs> we come in, we determine what needs to be done. Right now, we only concentrate on code violations and emergencies. Uh, if you fit within those two categories, we'll come in, we'll have a rehab specialist go in, determine what's wrong, we'll then sit down with the owner of the property, and we'll bid it out. And we usually bid it out to subcontractors. On some of the bigger rehabs, like uh, 72 <coughs> Newberry Street, we will work with a, a nonprofit or ourselves as a receiver, and then we'll also put together, once again, a rehabilitation work write-up specification, what needs to be done, and then we'll bid that out to a general contractor. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions? Yes. Excellent. I'll be around because Mr. Monahan, counselor, always feeds me, and he did mention desserts. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'll be around until they're gone anyway. And then if you have any questions, um, you know how to reach the BRA. Uh, give us a call, 508-586-3887, or just look up us up on the website. Yes, Tom. Uh, where are you located? 50 School Street, right across from City Hall. And if you go to City Hall and you have a problem, they'll always send you to the BRA. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yes, ma'am. Could you give us an update on the Ward 3 and Ward 2 renovations that are underway? Sure. Excellent. We've identified the, and actually that's available also on our website. We, did, we do a report every quarter, and that's the DPIR, Distressed Property Identification Re Revitalization Effort by the Attorney General's Office, in which the city received $150,000. We've hired an individual, Joel Hirschman, who's in our office, who actually, and the goal of this program is to identify bank-owned property mm -hmm. and get them to move it to put it on the market and get it into the hands. And we don't, in this case, sometimes we care, but mostly into first-time home buyers' hands or investors. Our biggest problem in, with the abandoned property is that it's abandoned or neglected. And it isn't, it isn't being marketed. It's not being anything. It's just staying there, which is affecting our marketability of property on, in our neighborhoods. So the goal of this program is to get the banks to do something with their property. And we, uh, the last quarter, his goal is to do 250 every quarter just to, and out of the 250, I think the last quarter there was like 45 that were identified throughout the city. Now, how many of those are in Ward 2, I can't tell you. 
But if you call my office, give us a call, we'll give you the report. And we can identify where they are, how many were in Ward 2, Ward 3, Ward 7, Ward 1. We can identify it. But he, I, I know as of last Friday, he had did probably close to 600 new properties that are vacant and abandoned in the city. All right? So we're working, and that's, that's just a year program, and he's, his second quarter is the end of this month, March 31st, which he'll prepare a second report. Uh, that'll be available to the mayor's office. It's available to the public, and as I said, it's also on our website. All right. Excellent. Yes. I'm Carson. sorry. Were all of the CDB, CDBG funds used for the first identified reason for the War Memorial? Uh, on here, because it says initially the project was to provide handicapped accessibility. Correct. Then the project was modified to create. Correct. We did an elevator. We spent over <coughs> over a three-year, I think it was a three-year period, mm -hmm. close to 2.1 million on the War Memorial, but it was over a three-year, it's a lot of money, let's just say it was over a three-year period. Elevator, accessibility, you, um, fire suppression, the whole, the whole extension, right. fire suppression system. The only thing missing from the War Memorial, and I guess we're not working on it, but we've identified is, a, is air conditioning. And the mayor's office is working on it, as well as uh, everyone else. So, but the the funding for this was it identified only for handicap accessibility? I don't understand when you say only. No, there were other issues with that building. No, 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 no. I mean the funding. The, the, could you use the funding for anything you wanted to do to to upgrade the building? Um, or were there parameters around the use no, of the funds? No, there were. There were. One, it was a limited amount of funding, mm -hmm. so you had to identify what activity you were going to focus that money okay. on. Okay. Yes. All right, that's and we focused okay. on accessibility was first. Okay. Well, let's say accessibility and fire suppression. It's a cement building, yeah. and it needed a, a fire suppression. Then it was upgrading the, the plumbing and electrical, which I don't think our money got into because that was a huge nut as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we spent maybe close to $2 million, but the overall rehab of that facility was well over, over $3 million. Yeah, for that facility. So, but it was well worth doing. I mean, it's a veteran's building, and it has a lot of history. Yes, ma'am. Um, who has access to use that facility? Does the public actually, or the public, can the public actually use that for? Yes, we're trying to it, encourage. What's it, well, how do you go about, say, if you wanted to have a meeting in that building, how, who, who would you contact to get permission to use the I, building? Is there <coughs> a rental fee for using the I building? I know there, well, there should be, but here's the thing. When you use a building, there are certain things. When you have a certain amount of people, you have to have a detail. Uh -huh. If you serve liquor, you have to have a detail. Okay. You may have to have two. So there's a certain fee. But it As a matter of fact, Shana, you may know, you guys just had a facility, uh, an activity there. Yeah, we, I know. we actually did. We, um, a, a, technically, a group of citizens under the Brockton um, Downtown Association, Downtown Brockton Association, held a welcome to spring, kind of end of the winter, reinvigorating, reintroducing gotcha. the woman world to the community. So at the time, we went through the mayor's office, but mm -hmm. if I understand correctly, the new trustees that will be appointed to there will be the ones that will take care of that, or maybe no, the mayor can the, speak to the that. The trustees will set the policy, so they'll make the decision in yeah, terms of policy and rates, but the mayor's office will still coordinate the actual rentals. Okay. And it is available to the public, and we really want at the public to use that facility. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. It is, and a lot of history in there. Those floors are great. You've already used it. I know. I was just there for the opioid, the opioid. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Excellent. Any further questions? Yes, sir. It may not, not directly be under your authority, but when the banks, and I'm sure you know the answer, they have a property and you find it and list it, if you will, uh, there are numerous ones, as you've said. If these go to auction, do they still have to have the bank that is certified report so that you don't get taken with what is or isn't wrong with these buildings? That's a good question. Most most of the time, they give you a period, especially when it goes to auction, when you buy it at auction, there's a period of time that you have to do a title search in order to make it a, I guess, a certified deal auction. But you have a time limit. And that the only way to see if there's any issues is when you run the title on those properties. When you run title, that means you do a title search. You search the mortgage, um, who held the property. Um. The biggest concern is whether 
Well, you never know that. It's you. you. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> like I said, you got desserts. I'll be here for a while. All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Bob. All right. I'd like to also recognize uh, Council Lodge Jay Stewart is here. Take the beach out of your mouth and say hi, Jay. <laughs> and we had uh, Council Bob Sullivan was here uh, earlier. And uh, we have registered deeds. Uh, John Buckley's here also. Good time. Good time. All right, now we're going to have a little neighborhood watch update. Uh, Bill Healy cannot make it tonight, but we have Nancy Liebberg, Chris Perez, and Ken Egan. So come on down, guys. And lady. <laughs> I think this is just a ploy to get me on camera again, but I'll keep it brief. I don't have his report, so he will catch up with you guys next month. Uh, some of you do know me, some of you don't. My name's Chris Perez. I'm uh, the community police officer assigned to uh, part of Ward 2. My community police beat falls within Ward 2 and uh, does uh, a big part of it is James Edgar Playground. Um, with me tonight is Officer Ken Egan. Ken's one of ten newer officers that graduated from the academy uh, near the end of I'm sorry, near the end of November. Uh, they're just completing their field training period now, and uh, within about ten days to two weeks, they're going to be hitting the road uh, on their own. Uh, that's ten new officers that'll be out on the streets on their own. Um, Ken spent six weeks uh, on the day shift with half the group, and he two groups switched after six weeks and now are uh, half run evenings, half run days. And, uh, Ken's been with me for about the last six weeks and in my beat learning community policing, not just uh, regular patrol and rapid response. And that's why I'm driving here with me tonight to show him another part of community policing. Um, with the weather, um, there's been a little bit less activity within the beat. Uh, usually during the summertime with people out and about, uh, it kind of picks up and especially with the park being closed for renovations, things have been a little bit quieter, um, but we look forward to the spring and um, good weather and the park coming back online. Uh, does anybody have any questions or concerns? Okay, that's it. That's a quickie. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Mark Lindy from the uh, Southeastern Regional uh, School Committee, or whatever it's called. <laughs> Take a couple of minutes, yeah. Thanks, Tony. I'll just be brief. Um, Southeastern Regional, 60% of the kids that go to Southeastern Regional are from Brockton. We have the largest population of the nine towns. Uh, the school's been totally renovated, uh, upgraded at no additional cost to any of the taxpayers of the nine communities. Uh, we bonded it for 20 five years, we got 80% funding from the Mass School Building Authority, and if anybody ever has any questions or concerns on Channel 12, the government channel, all the city officials' phone numbers are up there, and they're on our website for BCA, so if you ever have a question or concern about Southeastern, I'm glad to take it. Um, we also have, um, you know, these joint meetings that have just started to come up, we all the city council, the mayor the Brockton School Committee and the two representatives from Southeastern. We did the first meeting at West. The next one's in May. I don't have a date yet. But if you have a question, like if someone applied to Southeastern as a student, I can usually check a status for the application process. We, we do admissions. So I just wanted to let you know I'm around. I'm one of those obscure public officials. Okay, I'm not in the spotlight, but we have great kids over at Southeastern. We added programs the last couple of years like drama, music, 
um, video production and things like that that aren't normally at a vocational school. The school is beautiful. You can go over there for lunch four days a week. It'll cost you about $5.50 for a gourmet lunch. Luckily, I don't work there where I'd probably be another couple of hundred pounds because the food is so good. And there's, there's a hair salon for senior citizens. Obviously, I don't need it. Uh -huh. Tommy doesn't either, right? Uh, uh, but there you go. It's a, it's a great asset and a great um, school, and uh, I urge people to take advantage of it. Thank you. All right. Now we have Fire Chief Richard Francis. Is he still here? Oh, there he is. <laughs> Since the last time I was here, uh, obviously we have a new mayor, we have a new city uh, city council. Uh, mayor has been very supportive of me. Uh, I know his, his one of his big initiatives is on crime, but uh, he has been uh, very helpful to me, and uh, I wanted to pass that on. The city council, especially Council Monahan, has been very helpful with uh, my ongoing issues, and you know I've tried to help them with some ongoing ordinances. Uh, we have a recoup class of 12 that uh, are graduating in uh, two weeks, of which uh, seven of them are veterans of Iran and Afghanistan. Um, <clears throat> just so everyone knows, I'm also on the zoning board and in the traffic commission. If you ever have any issues, feel free to get a hold of me at my office. Um, <clears throat> as far as code enforcement, if you see something going on out there that are you, are you, you, you're having issues with neighbors not keeping the yard up or whatever, um, <clears throat> either call my uh, call fire prevention at 508-583-2933 or to the mayor's office, whichever is easy for you, and um, you know we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, <clears throat> obviously, big thing that's been in the news recently has been the, um, obviously, the uh, introduction of NACAN on all the fire department vehicles. The apparatus, um, <coughs> I have it in my own vehicle, plus all the stations have it. Uh, the entire department's now been trained on it. Um, <coughs> we've actually had eight saves so far uh, the last couple of days. Actually, knock on wood, we, uh, we haven't had to use it, so that's a good thing. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the mayor asked me about this, and, um, you know, working together within 12 days, we... Uh, able to get the knock in, get everybody trained, and get it on the trucks. In fact, while the mayor and I were having a news conference on it, we had our first overdose and our first save up on the railroad tracks down on Montello Street. So, obviously, there's a need for that. Um, other than that, does anybody have any questions? That was easy. You got one, you got one. No, you didn't get away that easy. Yes, sir. Well, we have to, we'd have to look into it and see. If you make the phone call, we'll look into it and find out what the story is on it. Okay? No, no, but, <laughs> you know, the thing is, somebody, somebody could be doing something like that and not realize that they have to have permits and, and whatever else. Okay? Okay, and now our final, the guest speaker, the, ma the main man, here he is, Mayor Bill Carpenter. Well, good evening, everyone. Great to be here with you at George's Cafe. And uh, my thanks to Council Monaghan for inviting me. Uh, I was originally scheduled to speak for 10 minutes tonight, but the City Council has cut me back to five, so I'm going to have to talk really fast. <laughs> Come on, we've got to have a little sense of humor. Come on. Come on, Council Barnes. It was funny. Yeah. <laughs> three minutes. You're three. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Whatever I do, I won't let him take another vote. Um, 
I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to comment on all the things that were talked about here at tonight's program. I think Council Monaghan uh, put together a great lineup of uh, speakers for the uh, Ward 2 community. I want to thank Chief Francis and all the firefighters for the way they've embraced uh, administering Narcan. Uh, it is saving lives, it is making a difference, and we are also uh, now in the process of training uh, all of our police officers, including school police. Within a few days, we'll also be carrying Narcan. And, uh, we're getting a lot of attention for it. That's not why we did it, but I think you're seeing a lot of communities follow our lead. Um, firefighters save lives. This just gives them another tool to save lives. Um, in terms of code enforcement, uh, uh, I did want to mention that we will be bringing up to the City Council in the next meeting a, um, a proposed amendment to the nuisance ordinance that would specify graffiti as a violation, failing to remove graffiti after 72 hours. And when we get it to the point of having a hearing on that, we will also introduce a city-sponsored program to help property owners offset the cost of actually removing the graffiti. So we're trying to have a, we want to have a balanced approach that working cooperatively with responsible property owners, but we do need the teeth in the ordinance when we have to occasionally deal with irresponsible property owners that just are not willing to address graffiti on their property. So uh, we will be proactive with that. Um, it's great to see Mr. Jenkins here with the VRA. Rob and I have spent a lot of time together in just nine weeks. Uh, we've met with HUD officials together in Boston. We've met with HUD officials together in Washington, D.C. We're working on a lot of initiatives together. I'm very excited about our relationship. Um, we've, the VRA and working with the HUD officials has just approved the funding for a Main Street manager. A position something that I feel is very important to the economic development of the city and we're getting ready to post that job any day and, and we've got the funding in place using CDBG funds uh, uh, for the year so uh, that will be a big help to revitalizing our business districts within the city particularly Montello, Campello and downtown so we're excited about working on that together and uh, I, I think that Robert and I both share uh, the focus that there's a major role for the VRA to play in helping us address vacant abandoned properties in our neighborhoods. Ward 2 is no different than any other ward in the city. Vacant abandoned houses and buildings are a blight on almost every neighborhood in the city. We have to be more proactive in getting them sold and reoccupied. We have to be more proactive using tools like code enforcement to hold banks responsible for maintaining the properties until they actually get them on the market to sell. So I think we'll be able to do a lot of good work in that area together. Um, great to see Jason Barboza here with the Vicente's proposal. Council Monaghan has been working, uh, with Jason's family, I think, for a couple of years now, trying to get that project finally off the ground. This is a great project for the city of Brockton. Um, it, it does so many things. It adds jobs. It brings a supermarket back to the downtown, but it really targets um, an area that's been a difficult area in recent years, and it's going to really revitalize that area by lights and people and commerce and a beautiful supermarket and a health center and some other stores that will eventually join the plaza. Um, so I jumped on board after the train was already rolling, but, uh, you know, I, I did approve and was happy to support the, the TIF financing that the city council approved. It's, it's I think, the perfect... Um, perfect use of what tax increment financing is all about to create jobs and, and spur investment in the city and particularly you know when a family like Jason's is willing to put their hard-earned money on the line and reinvest in our city we need to try to support them so Jason it's a great project I was actually down at his uh, store just yesterday and uh, looking around there we had a great time and, and I think one of the exciting things is Jason has told me that they're planning to keep the original Vicente store open on the south side. So this is true growth and true investment. And the regular customers on the south side, we can stay at their comfortable Vicentes, but it's going to bring a super store to the downtown, which is just a, a great, great project. And, and I think that the council and my office are, and all of us are working together to support uh, that project in any way we can. Um, I'm excited to see the progress on, on the James Edgar Playground. And the, there's some VRA money and CDBG funds involved uh, in a match w on that grant that's making that project possible. Um, a couple of things that will really be a focus of ours over the next uh, two years, and, and one is not just with the improvements, but 
we really have to reclaim the parks and the playgrounds and the open spaces. It's a big part of bringing our city back. I think in some neighborhoods, families don't use the parks and playgrounds anymore. Uh, they're afraid to. Um, we're going to keep them clean. We're going to get the graffiti off. We're going to get them well lit and safe. And we're going to empower neighborhoods to take their playgrounds and parks back. And I think this investment that's being made in the James Edgar is a great start. Um, we're working on and we'll be announcing in the spring a um, summer parks program for younger kids ages 7 to 12. I hope to have four or five playgrounds this year, the first year. Where we'll have a half a day program during the week free of charge for kids ages 7 to 12. We'll be able to give some college students jobs, summer jobs that they need. Uh, they'll act as mentors to younger kids 7 to 12 who will be mentored by Brockton kids that have gone on to college and are setting a good example. We'll provide a safe haven. We'll serve a healthy free lunch. And we'll get the kids in the pool for an hour every day. So I, I hope to do a lot more with it, but this first year we'll, we'll, we'll have either four or five playgrounds around the city and uh, I'm really excited about bringing that back. It's basically, we haven't finalized the name, but it's basically Brockton Before Dark to complement the Brockton After Dark program that's been so successful. And, uh, and we're working with the school committee and Andy Robinson to see if we can get the Whitman School back online. I know it's critically important to the folks in Ward 2. It's a process. The building needs work. We are having the feasibility study done. You know, if we are able to do it, it'll require a partnership between the school side and the city side. It's going to need some capital improvements, electrical, elevator. Um, but I think as we progress along, we'll hopefully be able to bring a plan to the city council that will include money coming from the school side, along maybe with having to borrow some money to do the capital parts of the school. Um, but I know that Andy and Tom and I all agree that we would love to see an elementary school brought back to that neighborhood in the Whitman School. So if there's any way to possibly do it, we'll do it. I've already committed to giving the building back to the school department if we can put together a, a, a reasonable plan that makes sense to get it updated and get it back online. We desperately need the classroom space. The Brockton Public Schools are growing by almost a net gain of almost 500 students per year. Last three years in a row, and that trend is projected to continue. I mean, imagine that. That's essentially the equivalent of an elementary school full of kids that we've taken on three years in a row. Net gain. That's net. And, you know, we have to, we're going to need more classroom space. If we don't create more classroom space, uh, you know, we're going to have 35 kids in a class. And I don't want that, and I don't think the parents do. So it's going to require some hard work and some tough decisions, but I think we're committed to to trying to make that happen. So, and finally, I just do want to comment on the War Memorial Building. One of the initiatives we've taken is to bring it back to, to use. The, the, one, the money was invested before I got here, um, but the building's been sitting there not being utilized. It's a public building. It belongs to the people of the city. It belongs to the veterans, but it also serves a purpose to be a, a, a great form for public meetings. I, I, I envision it being a performing arts center. I think we can do a lot with it while still respecting and maintaining the veterans' possession of the building. And, um, and we're having some great conversations. Um, last week, the council approved three new appointees that I sent up for the, the War Memorial Board of Trustees. And uh, so now, for the first time in a long time, we'll have a full active board working and, uh, you know, Councillor Barnes and her folks with Downtown Brockton Association just had a, a great event there. We've already held two public meetings there. There's another fundraiser scheduled. So I'll work with the Board of Trustees to keep the building affordable. I, I don't think we're looking to make any money on this building. We, we need to collect some money for the use of it to help offset maintenance costs. But um, I think what we really want to do is have this building be an integral part of the revitalization of the center part of the city, and, and that's how I envision it. So, uh, great meeting, Council Monahan. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, pleasure to be here. One more issue the Councilor wants me to address. Um, <laughs> We are actively uh, working on right now uh, preparing proposals that I'll be bringing to many of the major nonprofits in the city um, 
to look to negotiate pilot agreements with them, payment in lieu of taxes. Um, I, I believe very strongly, I support all the work of the nonprofits. I believe in their missions, uh, but the reality in our city is that our, particularly our commercial tax base has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking as the nonprofits have bought up more and more and more of the city. And um, the result of that is the people who are staying in Brockton and committed to Brockton hanging in, we're asking fewer and fewer people to carry a bigger and bigger share of the load. And I think the only way we're going to survive long term uh, as a city is we're, we need some contributions from the nonprofits that own a lot of property in the city to help offset the expenses. And we're going to approach it very methodically with formulas. Um, the requests will be reasonable. We'll only be looking for a portion of what the taxes would be on the property. I am not talking about houses of worship. I'm talking about, you know, major nonprofits that pay six figure salaries to their executives. You know, that's th those are the companies I'm talking about. And uh, actually, this Friday, I have uh, two people from City Hall uh, meeting in Boston with the person that runs their payment in lieu of taxes program. Menino was very successful at it and was a has been a key to uh, brought, uh, Boston over the last 20 years with Menino. So I've already started to have a couple of those conversations. They're not going to be easy conversations, uh, but, I, but I think the conversations we have to have. If this city is going to survive and thrive in the future, if, if, if properties and organizations are drawing on city services, they've got to contribute and help pay for the city services. So that's, uh, that's an initiative we'll be working on also. Thanks. Thank you. And just to follow up on that, uh, last November, Council Cruz and myself started this little initiative. Not, we didn't do the pilot program, but we were trying to get, and we're going to finally get some statistics on the strain on the police and fire budget that a lot of the nonprofits have put uh, down on, um, what, what is it down there, on uh, by uh, the old Sergeant Supply there. That, that um, yeah, down there. Uh, even the neighborhood health center or different uh, entities in the city, nonprofits that are having numerous calls per day, per month, hundreds of calls that are are taking away from the police and fire when they can be doing something else. So we're trying to look into that, what the cost of the city is for, to, for them to make all these runs to these different nonprofits that are not pay, paying any taxes to the city. So that's something else we're looking into too. So anyway, on that, I think that's it for the evening, unless you have any questions for me. No, you can't ask me a question. <laughs> oh, I know. Go ahead. I forgot. Just one question. Yes. I'm not sure if I asked you last year. With um, nuisance calls and, or nuisance noises, is there a time limit that when someone has a party in your neighborhood and they have had the music going since noontime that you can hear a mile away yeah, and it's getting to be 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night and you call the station a couple times, they're gone? Does the group leave? I can see it from my backyard. They started up again. Um, um, Chris. Now you have your complaints you made during one shift, right? And then um, and it spans into another shift. It may not be aware that you had called before, and I'm not sure if you did or didn't. If you let them know that you at least had been there before.
before and uh, <coughs> kind of coordinate a little bit towards that. But we don't have any hard and fast rules as it is now. We are, um, through our command staff, we are under the direction that if it is something that is definitely unreasonable, people are unreasonable, <coughs> that we will take court action against them. We can <coughs> determine who the property owner is, and we can file an application for complaint district court for keeping an unruly house. And we will do that, and a lot of times that has a lot of um, teeth once we show up for the for a second time and they're unreasonable. We try to identify who the homeowner is or the res or the property owner who's keeping the house and put them on notice that if it doesn't, they don't call the disturbance, if we do return, that that is the action we'll take. And then they get dragged into court, and we'll, um, hopefully that'll be the end of it, if it comes to that. But a lot of times, now that we're taking a proactive approach through our command staff and the direction, to actually do that and make them aware of it and okay. use the view like that. It may help. <coughs> okay. Oh, go ahead. Hi. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Heather Hallisey. Mr. Monahan said I could come here. Some of you may know me, <laughs> and um, some of you may not. But my husband and I took over 220 North Main Street in Brockton. Um, many of you probably don't think of that property. I don't know. I, should I go to the microphone? Yeah. No, that's, no, it's okay. I'll All right. Um, <laughs> you drive by it. It's considered. It was considered kind of a hopeless property. Um, there were eight mentally ill people living in there. It was full of um, all kinds of illegal activity when my husband and I went there. Um, I'm a social worker in the state of Massachusetts, and basically, I have my husband and I have a passion for the mentally ill and the chronically homeless. And um, we took it over two years ago. We cleaned it out. We renovated it, and um, we have housing for 23 people. So I don't think the city really recognizes it, um, but I think any police officer, if I mentioned the property, they would say, oh my gosh. But the 911 calls have decreased. The people aren't wandering the streets as much. People, you come in the house now when my children are, you know, <coughs> there and you can smell food. So basically we have, um, we have an opportunity to have another building. I have a 100% financial backer for the convent um, on St. Cashmere. It's been declined several times before the zoning board, but um, I think the issue is, is, <coughs> it's, is there's a stigma attached to the population, it, but if you run the place right, the people are managed, they, they remain sober, they do not bother anybody, and I think that I'm, I'm just trying to get to know people that care about the city and bring attention. The mayor has been there. Um, he, you know, came and met my husband, but um, basically I'm just trying to get the word <coughs> out there that home at last is legitimate. We do care about the people, and I think we have saved the city a significant amount of money. We no longer are a drain on 911. We don't have people dying on the streets, covered in urine. Those are the people that we deal with, and with the right medication, the right supports, and different um, coordinations and working with different services in the community, people stay stable. So I'm just <coughs> getting my name out there and letting you know that we are, we want to move forward with another building and really want support. Can I help you? 220 North Main. Yes. Um, is that the one across from the hat? That's from right. The White House? Yep. That's pushed back a little bit? Yep. When did you take that over? Two years ago. About a year and a half ago. Two tax years ago. So if you... Uh, who's the previous owner? It's, it's still owned, but who asked me that? I did. Um, Herb Mattis still owns it. Oh, long, no. long story. Don't want to get into it. Um, we have, we ran out of funds to redo the whole building, but we did the whole inside over. Um, and with the right supports, the people have thrived. But I have a referral coordinator, and I have multiple people that have no place to go. So you, your family lives there with 23 other no, no, my family chronically homeless and mentally ill people? Nope. But you said that the mayor went and saw your kids and your fam your husband and cooking No, and no, I said my, I said the children are there. Okay. And I met like on a daily basis. They do come there. Oh, I should have, okay. um, okay, I, I was after school, you. my daughter comes there. I'm just giving you an example. Before it was dark, dreary, drug ridden. Now you can go in there and you can see a six year old sitting on the couch is kind of what I'm saying. Okay. Big difference. Now, are there, um, you said it's, was it Home at Last? It's Home at Last. Okay, and you said it's legitimate, kind of like a, I don't, I don't, is this wrong, is this the wrong place for this? No. no, 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 no okay. No, 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 no. We're a lodging house in the city of Brockton. Okay. And the reason we did it okay. is because there is a trend. People, not everybody can live on their own in the community with mm -hmm. support. Sure. Some people need that additional level, and like, 
we the medications are locked up. The, the nurses come in, pharmacies deliver. So we have medication compliance. We have you know um, uh, work with DMH, the veterans, the VA, whatever, and kind of like a formula to keep these people stable. So you have staff there. Yeah, we have, um, my husband and I go there, and we have um, live-in staff. Okay, now you said that you'd run out of money or something. Now, just, uh, just so, so I'm clear with what you're saying, that you'd, um, your funds had depleted for some of the renovations or some, you know, some of the upgrading yeah, or whatever. More like, a, that's more of And a, you can pay for staff? Uh, that's more, well, sure. It's a, it's, we're not staffed very much. We're pretty, you know, I mean. We don't have that much money to pay for them. My husband and I work a tremendous amount of hours. Okay. We have some people that are higher functioning that live there, that watch over. But we have everything else is third party. Okay. How would we, uh, I don't even know, maybe I can ask um, Officer Perez or, or Officer Egan or Nancy, where are you? Um, how would we get maybe, because uh, the first thing you brought up actually was what perked my interest because I hadn't known that there had been some new management. Yeah. Um, for a couple of years, to be honest, the area, it still looks the same. The same folks are still hanging out there. I don't know if they're dying in their urine, but they're still hanging out. Not of so my, I, in our yard. I, I, I would like to kind of know if, uh, or if we could see maybe, or if you can maybe even bring it to the council. I don't know if this is the right place to do this, but since we brought it up, <coughs> if we can see if there is a, a dramatic decrease in some of the 911 calls or some of the um, first responder calls to that I, area I, since I, um, they took it I over. I got them from Officer Skinner from 2008. Text messages. <laughs> I will research for you. Okay, if you could, that would be great. Yeah, okay. I, I did get a printout from Officer Skinner. Um, I recently met with him in okay. 2008 to, to now. Um, there is a slight issue. Our building is used as a uh, point of, of uh, like a um, landmark. So that's kind of confusing. But the calls have changed dramatically from removal of person with a dangerous weapon to, you know, um, removal of, like, coming for, like, a intoxicated person or whatever. Um, you'll just have to see it yourself. But, okay. I mean, I think... Uh, I, I understand what you're saying. You, you know, right? Oh, people will... Uh, uh, I know of an address where there's a pay phone. Somebody will call 911 for whatever is going on in that general area. Uh -huh. And the call, will, because 911 call is received from a pay phone in front of this It'll get business, logged to that house. It goes, in as, it goes into the system at that. So when you run the numbers for a specific address, they may not be completely representative of... of what is actually originating from that address. Okay. And, and coinciding with the time, sounds about the time frame that she's talked about taking over that property, one of the other things that, um, for that neighborhood, um, that I think may have an effect on her also, and uh, I'm sure you've seen them, um, yeah. the city council has appropriated money for walking gates in yeah. downtown, mm -hmm. in Campello, yeah. and uh, I can attest to the fact that that is part of the Montello walking gate, um, so periodically through the week, Four hour increments, you'll have a couple of officers working uh, and walking the beat okay. in on North Main Street, North Montello, North Warren okay. Avenue, and that is also falls within one of the other community police beats um, that I believe at this time may or may not be staffed uh, due to a promotion. But uh, with the new officers we get, we may be able to once again have some community okay. police officers in that area. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. <coughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for letting in. For no, letting problem, in no problem, no problem. Just pay on the way up. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, just for uh, Nancy has some information also, but uh, I'd like to also recognize Archie Gormley, the president of uh, Firefighters Union Local 144 here. <laughs> and also, uh, Nancy, what's your name again? Oh, Mary Waldron, <laughs> former uh, director of the, uh, what's it, 21st Century. Get, step on the chair so people can see you. <laughs> We're all friends here. <laughs> Just because the meeting took that direction, I want to make sure you guys know about the MyPD app that you can download on your smartphone or Android. Uh, it's free. It's one word, M-Y-P-D, not N, but M as in Mike. Uh, it, it, it does have a spot to submit a tip, so if you want to anonymously submit something to the police department, you can. But also the other concerns that you guys have brought up are also listed here, so you can um, do, you can report something for a code enforcement violation, you can check out stuff on community policing, you can request uh, stuff from my office, which is community education. Um, it, it, it's useful, and I think it's user friendly because it's an application, and that's how people are communicating now. So if you want, check it out. Um, you can also still submit tips uh, 
We have voicemail. We have it on our uh, police website. We have it on our Facebook page, which is Brockton Police Community Education. And for those of you that don't know, we can um, you can now get your accident reports online if you go to BrocktonPolice.com. Thank you.